Well, my name is Cyril Dussault and I'm um, responsible for evangelizing the benefits of Paragon Automation from Juniper Networks. So in today's showcase, we are to review how to build the one automation of the future or the automated one of the future. So we, the need for automation is really no longer a secret, uh, but let me quickly review why automation is becoming more critical every day. We are continuing to see a massive growth in our network. By the end of the decade, we will have an impressive 20 times more connected device. Network architects have become more efficient and more complex. Network outages are still very expensive and making the news every day. And we, we all know that most outages are due to manual changes. And today it has become impossible to manage change at scale by delivering the quality and the speed that our CSP customers are requiring. So something must change. And like many in the market today, and many other network leaders, we believe that automation has a critical role to play. And luckily for us, and luckily for the industry, things can improve. 75% of all networking activity are still manual today. Uh, even more, we have 63% of CSPs that are using manual processes to manage their service lifecycle. And we learn from CSPs and from the analyst community that actually when they try to do it themselves, 70% of their projects fail. And it's really due to the complexity of building an automated one. So another issue that we see is the fact that 60% of network problems are still not discovered by NetOps. And so when we want to automatically, automatically improve networks or um, automate networks, we need to understand where the problems come from. And it cannot happen if the prob problems are not visible. So this is why at Juniper Networks, we did launch Paragon Automation. And Paragon is really a, a suite of applications products that have been designed to automate the, the planning, the orchestration, the assurance, and the optimization of modern networks. So with Paragon Automation, you can provision devices with your touch. You can automate service activation and testing. You can leverage AI to accelerate root cause analysis. You can predict issues and resolve them faster and optimize network automatically. So while our customers are starting with simple use case, they can leverage the same technology to deliver an assured experience with closed loop automation. And, um, you know, everyone here, if you're a fixed line provider, if you, if you're a mobile provider, if you have a, a, a business service provider, and even a large enterprise, a significant party, part of the traffic, the application critical traffic, is going to go through, through the, the, the one, the transport networks. And so when we talk about building an autonomous one also, we need to think about managing multiple network domains. So you will have to automate an access network, such as a metro or cloud network, an aggregation network, the edge and the core. And so all those network domains and, uh, and various layers from optical layer to layer three will need to be fully automatic, automated and uh, in order to deliver that that end-to-end -end automated one. So while many have uh, invested in a uh, service orchestrator here, some of the service fulfillment and service assurance function will need to be leveraged in order to achieve this. Um, and so the networks become truly programmable and driven through APIs. As the automation is quite of a, a wide topic. And so we, we decided to focus that tech field day on traffic engineering and closed loop remediation. Uh, this is simply because when we inquire with the market, when we, we look at our customers and as well the, the large enterprise and the CSP out there, they're telling us that traffic engineering and closed loop remediation are the two main a use case that they are focusing on right now and, and planning to invest in technology to, to, to solve those problems. So here we're going to talk to get today about pass diversity, latency-based routing, autonomous capacity optimization, and closed loop remediation. And I will pass to Kevin, who will uh, talk about those critical success factors. My name is Kevin Landry, and I work with Ciro uh, here on evangelizing our network automation uh, solution for the WAN at Juniper Networks. 
And today I'm going to be covering key success factors that are critical to moving towards an autonomous uh, transport network. So moving uh, to the first success factor, it's actually one of uh, the usual suspects for intent-based automation and it's model-based service orchestration, which accelerates provisioning and orchestration of the stateful VPN services you're gonna see on the right of the slide. Uh, and really what this does is it reduces configuration complexity uh, and the need for heavy manual provisioning efforts. Uh, what's important is that the service modeling will abstract complexity. And with this standards-based approach, uh, the network data is normalized and correlated to services in a way that provides a service-centric visibility. The, the next key success factor um, our second one is actually one that is surprisingly overlooked uh, by many network, network vendor automation solutions today, yet we feel it's so important. Uh, it's called active data plane measurements, and that's where you have test agents deployed in the network to inject synthetic traffic that appears just like an end user. And it's important because you really can't improve what you don't measure. Uh, so what this does is it allows you to measure the actual service experience during monitoring, or it's able to load tests to measure SLAs before you even activate the service. And the beauty of that is that uh, with this service-centric approach, uh, it's able to test on the data plane. So you can inherently test across any domain, whatever infrastructure technology you're using, whether it's across the WAN, whether across uh, cloud service chains and the data centers, uh, or even over SD-WAN, or even across partner, do uh, partner domains or the internet where you might not have control of these networks. So you really get a really uh, specific visibility end to end. You know, as a service provider, obviously the new turn up testing is is straightforward and, you know, happens when you turn on the circuit. But one of the things we've struggled with as a service provider is how to provide this at scale across the, the whole network. Because as soon as you have hundreds or thousands of services across hundreds or thousands of devices, you know, running this level of, of testing to verify the service starts to become problematic. So well, what are yeah. your responses to, to deal with that situation? I'm really happy you asked that question, uh, because in the past with passive DPI type solutions, there was a lot of, uh, I guess, cost and effort to deploy expensive probes in the network. And that was very, uh, it wasn't very timely because, you know, uh, it wasn't easy to roll those out in a very quick way. So you have immediate KPIs and, you know, that service level uh, quality uh, visibility. So, the solution that we have at Juniper Networks, uh, which is called Paragon Active Assurance, uh, what it's able to do is it's able to be very lightweight so that you could deploy it uh, in terms of the test agents as either a, a virtual network function, um, uh, on a hypervisor, or if you're using cloud, a cloud native approach and uh, you're able to deploy it as a container as well, or, you know, as software on a server. So the, the idea is you're able to deploy these in a way that uh, you could hit any part of the network and strategically place them. And it's very uh, quick to be able to do this. Customers are able to uh, basically do this within hours kind of thing and get their network up uh, with, with testing. It's very easy. And something else we actually launched this year was uh, within our devices itself for our Cloud Metro, we actually have embedded natively the test agents within the router software for our ACX uh, family. And what that gives you is the ability, uh, ability to turn that on on the routers itself from uh, day one so that you have immediate access to test Testing. So it's really going beyond, you know, the reflection-based testing that a lot of the vendors were using, like TWAMP and, and, and that kind of mechanism to, to something that's really testing service quality end-to-end -end and, and, and in a way that is um, service-centric. So you actually know that what you're testing is like end-user traffic because you're actually injecting end-user traffic or synthetic traffic. And then as a yeah, and then as a follow-up, if you're not using the standard reflection RFC methods, 
uh, how do you present that to a client that it's they're okay with you using their service for this for this testing thing for uh, you know adding traffic to the service they're paying for so a lot of times what happens is if you have a self-service portal as a, a service provider and you offer that to your customers, we're able to offer um, a solution that allows you to do uh, HTTP uh, yes, uh, speed testing. So you could actually, as a customer, test the connectivity of your application and validate that SLA performance. So that's one way as a customer that they see this. But many times, um, the, I guess the, the notion of being able to uh, be able to be proactive and be able to prevent these uh, kind of issues before customers even see them happening is really what's key for the solution. We want to be able to give and enable this providers a solution that's able to keep them ahead of problems so that they're able to address them so they could uh, really eliminate all the the customer dissatisfaction from poor quality uh, and the customer churn that's associated with that so when you're dealing with customers like healthcare and finance they're comfortable with the carrier injecting traffic into their private service the, the amount of traffic that we inject is very very small yeah it's very tiny it doesn't, it doesn't manage the damage the service yeah, like we're talking about a very small amount of traffic that there's really no performance concerns when uh, you, you inject this level of traffic. And now, of course, we can scale up and do load testing as well if we want to test, you know, some kind of data center backup and that we could actually reach that you know, level of uh, bandwidth. We could do that, too. But you, well, you would also have the RFC options available if people weren't comfortable with non-standard things being done. It definitely. I mean, we are testing uh, from layer two all the way to layer seven. So, you know, all the different standards in terms of like the IP and Ethernet layer, we're doing all the, the bread and butter cases that you would be able to do on the devices themselves. But we go beyond that uh, to do, you know, all the way up to layer seven as well. I think uh, having this built in is a real great uh, competitive feature because what we're seeing with some of the enterprise uh, based Testing products is they're still in the costly onesie, twosie, hundreds range. And what I'm anticipating is scaling this up. But if you can get your provider to do a lot of it for you, um, that really simplifies the enterprise customer side for the service provider, I would think. Definitely. This data that gets, um, you know, this testing data, you obviously are going to have a whole wealth of information potentially over time. Is that trackable anywhere long term? Can you set up regular testing that just, I mean, obviously it's active. So that, you know, presumably these are ongoing things. Is it, is it recorded anywhere that can be referenced as a baseline? Yeah, definitely. Uh, basically, there's the approach where we're doing monitoring and you, you're able to feed that data even into other performance systems. In fact, we do that where we feed this kind of data. Say we're doing some kind of latency testing, for instance, we might feed that data into what we have uh, in terms of our AI um, engine, which is in another product called Paragon Insights. So with that, you're able to get not only the service level visibility, but go deeper into you know other types of telemetry. And actually, that's what I'm going to talk about on the next slide. We believe that it's a marriage of both telemetry approaches with the passive data with the active data that's the best choice. So I guess moving on then um, to the third success factor, and that's really, you know, to extend the conversation that we were just having, having a, a comprehensive network observability stack is key because your automation that you have is really only as good as the insights that drive it. So this is very important for both improving operational efficiency, but also to enable that automation. So yeah, having that breadth of telemetry data is so useful. Um, you know, it gives you that visibility into network performance, but it's also able to map that to services so that you could understand their health as well. And 
really, as I was talking about in the questions, the data could be, it's very versatile. We could actually, you know, export it to you know, different systems, but we could ingest it from whatever data source. Uh, and that we think is a, a best practice. You really need to be flexible on that, uh, whether it's a data lake or a third-party system, whatever infrastructure domain, whatever vendor, uh, you have to be able to normalize it and make it meaningful by deriving specific KPIs. Uh, but the problem is that telemetry can only get you so far. So that's why we really advocate for the active data plane measurements uh, that really should be a part of that observability stack. Because as mentioned, you're not going to be able to improve it if you can't measure it. But in addition to that, I'll just extend it even further. You can't react to what you don't know about. So what we're finding in a lot of customers uh, and why they, they buy into this is that the measurements often help them to detect, detect silent issues that have been creeping up in them or they didn't even know existed. And those are the ones that would eventually disrupt services. So that's why this is so powerful. You mentioned earlier about the telemetry and you can only have all the telemetry information and all the visibility based on the data you get into the box. So then my question goes along the lines of what does happen or, or how do you get information into the tool that is not necessarily driven or derived from your measurements? Assume you have a service provider that, of course, lives in the future and uses Netbox to have a single source of truth and for instance, yeah. has a list of prefixes or links or any other type of information. Are you able to ingest all that? Because there is a limit to what you can measure with the with the agents. And this also goes hand in hand with multi-vendor environments. Definitely. And so the way Juniper's approach that is we don't do it within our active assurance product. We, we do this when we marry it with our Paragon Insights that you're able to have an approach where, you know, we do all the, the base like Kafka bus type things and REST API ingest and, you know, through NetConf and, and like, you know, any kind of telemetry, right? GRPC, you know, all, the, all of that's done for streaming telemetry. But um, where we go beyond is we have something called bring your own ingest. So that allows you to basically write rules where you could ingest from any data source. Um, so I, I hope that answers your question. Okay. So for instance, because uh, earlier then we were talking about then a service being then turned up and doing testing, but what if, for instance, you deployed and there's a, there's a brown, uh, uh, Brownfield deployment. And then, oh, there is a service that we just have turn up. We just put a P in this particular section of the network. The, the, yeah. the, the rest is irrelevant. But then had you get into the tool, you simply add a new node or do you have to pull the new node from another different tool? Because uh, again, there will be many things that are driven by automation, but there are always these special cases that are not covered by some automation, then which are the other ways in which you can add this? Can you get into yeah. the tool and put another node and things like that? Exactly. You could do that. Um, so, you know, you could add a, a device into monitoring. And it's important to note that we support legacy types of collection like SNMP and even CLI, right? So um, it, it's really, uh, I guess we're trying to focus on the flexibility to be able to really include any data source. And it's important, mm -hmm. I think it's a best practice that you're able to have that, I guess, programmability. Uh, we go and extend that further. We have the ability to even take that data and automate it with what we call playbooks. So you're basically using the data to trigger actions and we could integrate with uh, SDN the solutions like our Paragon Pathfinder to you know trigger optimization or even orchestration systems where we're gonna you know provision as well based on you know if there's a change needed that we need to react to in the network. I guess at the heart of what we're going to be talking to today is our fourth success factor. Um, it's the one that we're actually going to be uh, focusing on demoing today in our second video recording. And it's all about AI-driven multi-vendor SDN control, which really is the foundation to moving towards that autonomous self-driving network. And some of the use cases we're going to talk to you about today uh, include path diversity, latency-based uh, routing, autonomous capacity optimization and closed loop remediation.
And again, that's going to be in the demos. So I won't talk too much because we're going to hear a lot about that from Julian. Um, and then I'll move on to the final and fifth uh, success factor, uh, which, which is related to SDN control as well. And, and it's multi-vendor interoperability. So, you know, a lot of vendors claim multi-vendor interoperability, multi-vendor multi support, but we feel that it's really important as a best practice to get involved in testing that and actually, you know, uh, kind of not just uh, talking the talk, but walking the walk, so to speak. You know, we want to make all this automation work in today's modern networks, no matter what vendor that's being used. And, and it's really important in order to do that um, and get the best results that you prove it out with you know, some kind of organization such as the EANTC, um, where we were able to do interoperability testing with other vendors uh, that are, are the, the key ones out there in the industry anyways. And also um, to be able to, you know, have experience with our product managing multi-vendor devices and real customer deployments. Um, so uh, what we do is uh, all the leading vendors in WAN SDN control we get together annually for this interoperability testing at the ENTC. Uh, and this year we were able to validate our SDN controller, which we call Paragon Pathfinder with Cisco, Nokia, and Huawei. And another thing we've done is um, we have tier one and tier two service provider customers where we actually had no Juniper install base for our network equipment. And those customers deployed our Paragon automation to manage those other networks based on our competitor's equipment. So, you know, it just goes to show that when you, uh, you know, you, you, you go beyond just the, the normal talk of multi-vendor and prove it out, great things could happen. You see that customers will, you know, embrace your equipment because when they test it out, they know it's working, right? In, in, in talking about that, I, the first of all, I think the multi-vendor strategy is great. I think that's, you know, in service provider, it's, you know, pretty much the way it's been for a long time. So that's great. Looking at the protocol stack here um, in the transport options that you have, I see all the usual suspects of, SRM PLS, SRV6, BGP LU. Mm -hmm. I spent a lot of time consulting for tier two and tier three ISPs, typically last mile ISPs. And one of the things we're seeing is, is that MPLS and L3 is getting pushed out way far into the last mile, um, whereas traditionally it's been you know Metro Ethernet based. And as such, we have a mix of data planes that are out there in a lot of networks where we have LDP traditionally, and then you know, we're mixing in SRM PLS. What does this look like if you're a service provider that's in the middle of transition from LDP to SRM PLS? Oh, okay. I mean, yeah, it, it's the kind of thing where, um, well, from my past experience, I know that we support both, right? So if you're using RSVPTE, you're able to deploy this and be able to get that visibility right away and start to automate with a little bit of control in terms of all these use cases that we're, we're going to talk about. But I think what I'll do is um, I'm going to leave this question and, and introduce Julian, because I know that we also do the segment routing. A lot of times, you know, there's kind of an evolution where they start up segment routing in a separate segment, uh, segment to be able to, you know, as a greenfield, to start that up. So they're kind of managing both, but they would, in most, in my experience, they're using two different, two controllers uh, for that, even though you could support both in one, but it's just because of, you know, scaling to different domains. Uh, you know, you, you, you mentioned the, the MPLS side and obviously, you know, PSAP and, and segment routing are a big part of making, you know, the multi-vendor on the path side of, of things work. Um, and, you know, with the experience that I've had with North Star and now Paragon Pathfinder, you know, that, you know, those standards are incredibly important to that kind of system working and then in the service provider, because, you know, as Kevin mentioned, there isn't a service provider in the world that's a hundred percent any vendor. So, aside from the from the path side of things, what are the other standards you're working with uh, to to ensure this end to end yeah. working thing? Uh, Certainly, BGP like you know protocols like BGPLS are helping us gain visibility of the topology. It's really important that we support PSEP because that's giving us ability to work on a multi-vendor basis. You know, there's uh, standards uh, for segment routing. Uh, ultimately, I think 
maybe Julian could, he's more the expert in this domain, I would say. I mean, the other set of um, standards, um, if you like, are related to um, telemetry. So open config is becoming increasingly of interest um, as a means of, you know, standardizing the way that telemetry is sent by the network devices to the um, automation systems. So certainly we support, um, you know, open, open config as a um, telemetry um, ingest mechanism. So that's another good example of um, standards-based approach.